It's a great honor to present this keynote address at this annual meeting uh, for which actually I, I don't think I've missed one, uh, whether as a presenter or as a member of uh, the audience. My message is for physicians, and I hope you'll hear me now, that MSCs will change how medicines practice, and I hope to provide you with a clear opportunity to agree with that message. So can you hear me now? If, if you can't, I hope to clarify the message. This is my obligatory disclosure. Um, it turns out that uh, I started a company called Osiris Therapeutics. Uh, the cell therapy portfolio for that company was purchased by Mesoblast. Uh, they provide Case Western Reserve with a royalty, which Case Western Reserve University generously shares with me, which uh, won't support much of my retirement fund. I'm fortunate because I've had contacts with really important and influential people. And as Isaac Newton said in 1645, if I've ever seen further than others, it's because I'm standing upon the shoulders of giants. And so I'm going to introduce you to these giants and the lessons I learned from them and the lineage of my scientific and personal career. So here are the giants that um, I've come in contact with. They've all had an enormous influence on my thought processes and thus on my career and I'll introduce you to them uh, one at a time. The message that I want to leave you with and for which I will repeat numerous times is that there are no real stem cells in adults. There are no, therefore, there are no stem cell therapies that can be administered. There are therapeutics from cells, and I will show you how they work and how they've been used. So I hope that you get this message, and it's understandable and um, clarifies the situation for you. Regenerative medicine is derived from a detailed molecular and cellular study of how embryos put their act together. In addition, for me, there's aspects of embryonic limb formation, which provided the foundation of my understanding um, aspects of regenerative medicine, and I'll explain that in due course. If I was standing in front of this audience, I would ask you to tell me whether if I had the tip of my finger guillotined off, whether I could indeed regenerate that fingertip. You'll see why that's important. I would ask you now to either write down on a piece of paper or memorize your answer to this question. In most cases, people will say that I am so old that I couldn't possibly regenerate this cut off fingertip. We'll see what I so lessons and lineages, and, and, and how do I understand and get you to understand uh, these aspects? So uh, I was born in Chicago on January 5th, 1942. This is a picture of me when I was three years old in Chicago. I think I'm rather adorable. Um, I went to Wicker Park Elementary School in Chicago. And actually, at graduation, quite surprisingly, I was awarded an American Legion Award. Um, it, it was not only for scholarship, but for contributions to the school and service uh, to the school. It was quite a shock for me to receive this award, but it 
it was hugely important because it said that the teachers who voted this award had confidence in my ability to go forward. For me, uh, growing up very poor, uh, this was a very important um, addition to my fledgling uh, uh, confidence. I graduated in, from Roosevelt High School in Chicago in 1959, and in a series of very complicated events, eventually went to the Illinois Institute of Technology, where I started out as a chemical engineer and eventually got a BS in chemistry. From the Illinois Institute of Technology, I went to the Johns Hopkins University Medical School to the Department of Physiological Chemistry. Dr. Albert Leninger, who uh, wrote a, a textbook uh, during my time at uh, Hopkins, uh, was in essence the laboratory that I worked in. Um, he immediately put me off onto his Italian, newly uh, uh, arrived Italian postdoc, Ernesto Carapoli, who looks uh, much younger than he does in this picture, uh, since this is a more recent picture of Ernesto, who is himself a very well-known scientist working on calcium um, transport and other aspects uh, in cells and in particular in the mitochondria. This is how I remember Leninger, the young Dr. Leninger, and behind him uh, it, are, are parts of the mitochondrial electron transport uh, kinetics and generation of ATP. Leninger, in uh, the first 10 weeks of medical school, gave about 80% of the lectures. He would come in at 7.30 in the morning, fill up that blackboard with notes, and then uh, from 8 to 10 o'clock, he would lecture and most of us would copy the notes down and sit back and listen to Leninger because he was a brilliant lecturer as he was a brilliant uh, author of his biochemistry textbook. Um, at medical school, I took the first, when I went to Hopkins, I took the first two years of medical school and um, following the biochemistry course, there was of course histology and this is a page from Blumenfaust's histology book of that era, 1963. And uh, what, what, what is clear um, from this is that um, histologists deduced the differentiation um, lineages of all of hemopoiesis, and they called this hemopoietic stem cell, which they identified, uh, uh, hemocytoblast. And um, in, uh, just to put this in context, the first bone marrow transplant uh, was completed in 1957, so we're talking about a relatively young technology. Um, what you see here is the formation, for example, lineage lineage formation of erythrocytes. And so each one of these is a differentiation step. Again, there's no molecular biology in this era. And, and so all of this pathway has been deduced by, from blood smears by histologists. What we now know is that the cytokines and growth factors that control this step, also uh, the erythropoiesis, Putin, um, controls this step. We know that the cytokines and growth factors controlling this particular step also have a profound effect on this pathway. So this is a very complicated uh, uh, lineage pathway. And obviously, this is an important slide because it is uh, dominant in my thinking 
um, in a variety of ways, as you'll see as we move forward. So it turns out that every single second, 15 million of your blood cells drop dead and are perfectly replaced. This represents an example of your innate regenerative capacity. It turns out that every single tissue of your body, without exception, turns over in this regard with uh, known half-lives. And again, um, you're alive because you continually renew these tissues. So in bone marrow, there's a cell which is called, uh, which has been called a hemopoietic stem cell. It turns out this is not a stem cell. It's a committed progenitor. It means that it can make all those 20 or 30 blood cells, but in reality, uh, it can't make nerve. It can't make muscle. So it's not a proper multipotent stem cell. It's a multipotent committed progenitor. In bone marrow, um, it turns out there's another cell, which is which I have named uh, mesenchymal stem cell. You'll see why. And, and the, I want to again make the strong point, and you'll see why, uh, that there are no stem cells in adults. So this mesenchymal stem cell, it turns out, is a mistake, and I'll show you why and how. So in the late 1980s, my colleagues and I did experiments in which we isolated uh, mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, onto petri dishes. I'll show you that technology. And in culture, we could use very strong inductive agents to get the cells to go down this lineage pathway to bone or this different lineage pathway stimulated by a different set of macromolecules uh, to make cartilage or muscle or fat or or tendon, ligament, etc. So again, the, you see how that uh, Blumen Fawcett uh, lineage slide uh, affected the way I thought about all of these activities that we assayed uh, in tissue culture. And again, um, there's another piece of this, and you'll see why, um, that these MSCs. Um, the, the concept of MSCs is sort of anchored in how embryonic limb mesenchymal uh, tissue develops, but it's not how actually MSCs uh, uh, function in adult organisms. So I'm going to talk about my lineage and my past. And so I got my PhD in 1966 from Johns Hopkins, and I went to Brandeis University to do a postdoc with N.O. Kaplan, a very famous biochemist of that era, chairman of the biochemistry department at Brandeis. And I convinced Nate, who uh, has studied uh, nicotinamide, that um, there were papers in the literature where nicotinamide analogs caused birth defects, one in, in chick embryos. Uh, one group of analogs um, caused muscle malformations, and one caused cartilage or bone malformations. So I, I suggested to Nate that we could work out the molecular details uh, of how these analogs worked. And he introduced me to a member of the biology department in a different building, Edgar Zwilling. And, and Ed Zwilling um, was a brilliant scientist, a brilliant um, embryologist, and uh, he published a group of papers on chick limb bud development in the 50s and in the 60s. And what Ed showed is that the ectodermal jacket, so he could actually take this jacket off like it was a baggie turn it around upside down. And what he showed was that this apical ectodermal ridge, this thickening, uh, led the outgrowth of that limb bud, whether it be a leg or a wing, 
And, and uh, this was a very important and seminal observation. We now know what molecules are made by the ectoderm and how the mesoderm responds. Uh, but in the 50s and 60s, uh, the molecular details were really not known. What Ed also showed me how to do was to dissect off the limb bud and take the ectoderm and get rid of it. And with the dissociation of these mesenchymal cells in a special medium that I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, I put these cells in culture on a 35 millimeter Petri dish. If you put 1 million cells, you, you initially into that dish, you could easily see muscle develop. Second, if you, if you did 2 million cells, you could identify nodules of bone. And if you did 5 million, which is a multi-layer to start, uh, they made mounds of uh, cartilage. And so I'm studying now on a Petri dish, muscle, bone, and cartilage. And this system uh, represented uh, a paper which I published uh, with Nate Kaplan and Ed Zwilling uh, in science in 1968. So in the 1970s, um, I spent, uh, the, my, my students and I spent a lot of time um, um, showing that nicotinamide, which is vitamin B3, uh, high levels outside produce high levels of NAD inside the cell, and that um, gave a muscle differentiation. Low levels gave cartilage differentiation. And, and we followed the, the, the ADP ribosylation of histones, which seemed to control this differentiation pathway. So again, uh, uh, in 1969, I came as an assistant professor to Case Western Reserve. This is Marcus Singer. Marcus Singer and his uh, esteemed colleague, Howard Schneiderman, uh, started the Developmental Biology Center at Case Western Reserve in the early 60s. Uh, when I walked into the biology department, uh, its chairman, Howard Schneiderman, left to become a dean of the medical school at Irvine. And 10 years after that, Howard uh, became VP for research for all of Monsanto and actually started the green res revolution at Monsanto, started their plant sciences division, bought seed companies, bought uh, pharmaceutical companies, and changed Monsanto into a modern biotech company. So in any case, Singer, a very successful scientist on his own right, uh, studied limb regeneration in the newt. And what Singer quite brilliantly deduced is that these yellow, these yellow stripes that you see in this slide are nerves, and that um, once the, uh, um, the, the wound was covered over by ectoderm, um, this blastema formed, and the cross-section of nerves in that blastema actually played a profound role on the differentiation uh, uh, of that of those cells, and I'll talk more about that in in a few minutes. Um, this is uh, Elizabeth Hay. Elizabeth Hay was a professor at Harvard in the cell biology and developmental biology uh, part department. Quite unusual for a woman. Uh, a, to be in science, and B, to be a professor at Harvard. And this is her student, Don Fishman. Uh, this is a picture of Fishman when he retired uh, from being the chairman of cell biology at Cornell and dean of the graduate school. Uh, they published a paper in 1961 in which they identified a group of cells, and eventually other people showed that these cells were committed progenitors in the blastema. And one group of progenitors went uh, to cartilage, and the other group of committed progenitors um, went to muscle in this blastema. There's another cell 
that uh, was in this group that we now know is the MSC and actually controlled a, a lot of the expansion of the blastema and how differentiation uh, occurred. So in science, as in life, we take what people give us and we uh, adapt it to our own situation. As you can see from um, the previous slide that I showed you, uh, the, the pathway that I was looking at in limb buds uh, was very similar to this. And so this became a, a, a logic statement for me. So again, um, is this an original idea? No. Um, is this how mesenchymal cells in embryonic tissue differentiate? Is this what happens in adults? No. This, there are no stem cells in adults, and this for sure doesn't happen in adults. If you're in orthopedics, um, you know that when a bone fracture, uh, you set up a regenerative group of cells, and I'll come back to this, a little bit later, you have an outer covering which helps lead the way for this differentiation. But this is comparable to the newt blastema and the uh, MSCs that are in here and committed progenitors eventually give rise to the regeneration of bone. So again, <clears throat> this is a hypothesis diagram from the 80s. And the dogma of that day, very important to understand the dogma of that era, is that what you saw in cell culture is what you saw in vivo. And based on that, I published a paper and coined the term mesenchymal stem cells for cells that I isolated from bone marrow in culture. And my assumption was that these were stem cells and they gave in vivo regeneration of muscle, cartilage, bone, et cetera. And so uh, that was the basis of coining this term mesenchymal stem cells and uh, assuming this is what happens in vivo. So the original technology, uh, I got a scoop of bone marrow from an orthopedic surgeon, Victor Goldberg. We dissociated the marrow and separated all these cells. And we put on a 100 millimeter Petri dish um, a, um, about 20 or 30 million marrow cells. And a few of these colonies formed. Um, and, and again, the important aspect of this technology was this very specific medium. We used the medium from chick limb uh, mesenchymal stem cell cultures. We used that medium worked on human bone marrow and allowed uh, efficient colony formation. And, and then these cells divided like crazy. And in vitro, we could push them into these different lineage pathways to make fat or cartilage or, or bone, etc. So this was the base technology. And it turns out, again, uh, this assumption uh, is wrong. It's completely wrong. And so um, how, how do we redo this? Well, you can still use these cells that we isolate and expand in culture to do tissue engineering because, again, we know how to get them to go down these lineage pathways. But if you want to deal with regenerative medicine, it only has to do with the MSC that forms in vivo, and it has very special properties, which I'll, I'll focus on. MSCs, MSCs are not stem cells. So um, it turns out today, um, you, there's all of these tissues in your body. Every single tissue, um, there's a publication which says that they can get MSCs from kidney, from fat. I mean, for someone who worked on marrow within the orthopedic context to, to consider fat as a source for MSCs, 
is, is quite revolting. But the issue is, what, what do all of these tissues have in common? And what I missed at that era was that <clears throat> all of these tissues have blood vessels in common. And indeed, it turns out that MSCs are derived from these perivascular cells. This is a capillary uh, in heart. And, and when uh, Bernie Siegel took his blood pressure medication this morning, um, this is the cell that's responded. It squeezes to make high blood pressure and relaxes to give you low blood pressure. This is the uh, progenitor of MSCs, and I'll show you that in, in a minute. But these are perivascular cells. You have 100,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. Every single blood vessel, without exception, has the pericytes on them and and the pericytes some of the pericytes can give rise to MSCs again these are pericytes um, and some of these pericytes give rise to MSCs. again here's another picture scanning EM of pericytes all of these pictures that I have shown you uh, clearly document morphological differences in these cells because each one of these vessels is in a different tissue. How clever have I been? And uh, we're very clever, we scientists, at kicking off these pericytes, getting them to form MSCs, putting them in culture in special media, and getting them to differentiate into cartilage or into fat or into bone or into muscle. So again, um, MSCs in vitro are multipotent, but not in vivo. There are no stem cells in your body. There are committed progenitors, as I'll talk about. And here's a paper that documents this point of view. If these um, uh, pericytes are labeled red, and you take an animal and you get it, uh, actually allow it to age, or you put it on a very high fat diet so it makes a ton of fat, or you break a leg and it's got to repair the bone, the pericyte does not contribute to this new tissue that's forming. And so therefore there's no lineage plasticity in vivo. That's, this paper has some problems, but that's what this paper clearly documents uh, that the pericytes um, although in vitro, we can do all of that as they document, but in vivo, these cells don't go into fat, don't go into bone, etc. So, so I want to I want to make a very strong point here, and and actually, my colleagues, Dr. Samoza and Korea, and I did a a, 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 a poster for Nature in 2016, and and what we said was that this was a, the universal stem cell niche. It's not a stem cell niche. It's a committed progenitor niche. So the committed progenitor is yellow. It's sitting on a pericyte, MSC pericyte. And both of those cells are sticking their fingers through endothelial cells into the bloodstream. So this could be a hemopoietic progenitor. This could be a neurostem cell, quote stem cell. Could be a liver committed progenitor. Could be a muscle progenitor. This is what the universal committed progenitor niche looks like. And, and this is an important aspect because this pericyte um, is very different, as I showed you pictures uh, previously of these different pericytes they were from different tissues. So this pericyte in bone marrow for the hemopoietic progenitor is making molecules that a pericyte that's sitting next to a myogenic progenitor, they're making different molecules. But again, this is not a stem cell. It's a committed progenitor. So if you break your blood vessel, you have an injury. The pericyte comes off, it differentiates, it changes into an MSC. That MSC senses the microenvironments and becomes activated 
that activated MSC from the front makes a curtain of molecules that control the immune system. So if you put my MSCs into Bernie Siegel's arm, um, his immune system would not be able to see my MSCs because my curtain of molecules would inhibit that process. From the back of the MSC, it makes molecules which are anti-scarring, which are mitogenic for committed progenitors, which are involved in pain management, make molecules that sit on opioid receptors, make molecules that kill bacteria on contact. And I'll talk about uh, various aspects of this in a few minutes. But this is a regenerative microenvironment, not a scarring environment. So the MSC uh, uh, has profound secretory capacity. So therefore, uh, it, it, it's being used in, in over, there's over a thousand clinical trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov. I, I copy pasted all of the symptoms that they're trying to cure. I put it in larger, uh, bolder type so you could see it. Uh, Crohn's disease, graft versus host disease, MS, ALS, kidney transplant, acute myocardial infarct, chronic heart failure, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and, and even autism. Uh, there's clinical trials testing the medicinal properties of MSCs for these different ailments. Um, in a meta-analysis of uh, and review articles, the predominant uh, choice of uh, malady has to do with uh, musculoskeletal system. And there's eight products um, that have been approved worldwide. There are no MSC products currently approved in the United States uh, for therapeutic use. So again, if somebody offers you a stem cell uh, therapy, there are no FDA approved stem cell therapies. If it's a clinical trial, it's a different story. But if somebody's going to charge you for stem cell therapies, uh, they're certainly not using MSCs. And in all likelihood, they're not using any stem cells because I don't know of any trial currently going on with real stem cells. So this allows me now to, to, to change the name of MSC. Now, I, you know, I keep the MSC nomenclature, but as I've said a hundred times, they're not stem cells. They're medicinal signaling cells. They're drug stores for sites of injury. And there's a paper uh, that I wrote uh, uh, in 2010 to change that name. Again, no stem cells in adults. So this is fat. Uh, fat um, is one of the most highly vascularized tissue of your body. In one cc of fat will give 300 to 500 fold more MSCs than one cc of marrow. So again, we know how to kick that pericyte off and culture fat-derived MSCs. Um, and, and this is a fabulous paper in which they uh, do single cell seek on uh, MSC preps from bone marrow or from fat. And this is what's called principal component analysis. And what you see is the marrow-derived MSCs segregate from the fat-derived MSCs. Um, these cluster a little bit more closely because uh, marrow is a pretty homogeneous tissue, although these are from individual donors, and so every donor is different. Fat depends on where you liposuction it and how you liposuction will give you a, a broader distribution of anatomical figures. The more important piece from this paper is illustrated here. In, in, in this case, with single-cell RNA-seq, you, you sequence every single RNA molecule in the cell. And it turns out there's 17,213 that 
that fat-derived and marrow-derived MSCs have in common. This is the signature of an MSC. The MSC that comes from marrow has 1,400, which are unique to marrow, not found in fat. And likewise, in fat, there are 1,800 not found in marrow. It's the microenvironment in which a fat cell, a fat pericyte exists and the microenvironment in which a marrow, a pericyte or MSC exists are very different. And so therefore, these are unique to the source of the MSC. So MSCs are MSCs. They have a core of common response elements and common potential, but, but they have unique properties which are from the site in which you isolate them. So again, um, uh, if, for example, you, you got a pericyte from one of these big blood vessels, or you got a pericyte from one of these capillaries way out here, these are different microenvironments, and, and these would give you a different uh, spread of uh, messages. So in this paper, um, what you see is these are committed pre-adipocytes. These cells will become fat cells. This is a, a, a progenitor cell population. And this, uh, the, the messenger RNA for, for this protein um, is, is, is a really good marker with, with CD55 for this population of cells that are quite different than this population of cells. So again, using single cell RNA-seq, we can tell you that the MSC preparations have eight to 10 to 12 different clusters of cells with unique transcripts in them. This transcript is not found uh, when you assay for this transcript. So again, uh, uh, w what cells have in them uh, will de be determined by where they come from and, and what microenvironments they sense. So I'm going to change gears for a moment, but you'll see it's the same story. This is a, a very famous uh, orthopedic surgeon, Mar Marshall Yurst, a very close friend of mine. Marshall, when he was a little bit younger, this is Jerry Gross, who was at MIT, very famous researcher and uh, physician. Um, Marshall, in uh, 1965, published a paper in which he took bone and took the mineral out of bone. He demineralized the bone. And so now you're left with the, the extracellular matrix, the, the, the organic matrix of bone. So he called this demineralized bone matrix. And he implanted it into a muscle pouch uh, of an adult uh, mouse. And he came back six to eight weeks later. And in that position, in that wrong position, he found newly formed bone. And he uh, actually uh, hypothesized that there were proteins from the demineralized bone matrix which leaked out and caused the formation of bone. And he called those proteins bone morphogenetic proteins, BMPs. He coined that term. And, and the BMPs pushed cells, progenitor cells, into becoming cartilage and bone. So of course, uh, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I assumed, quite mistakenly, I assumed that the BMP responsive cells were the adult MSCs that were resident in muscle because in vivo, those were the cells that naturally gave rise to bone or cartilage or these phenotypes. So it turns out that that's wrong. So the question is, what's the BMP responsive cell that's in muscle? Remember, there are no stem cells in adult. What is this responsive cell, because this is a very important uh, uh, question to ask in this regard. In particular, again, because I assumed 
that it was the MSC, uh, not the case. So uh, if you have a compound fracture of the femur, um, a trauma surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, will put a rod down to stabilize the, the, the newly formed construct. He'll put the pieces back together. He'll put a little bit of marrow and clot to keep everything in place. Um, and, and then what he'll do is he'll take these big muscles, which are sitting uh, around, and he'll flap that muscle onto this. And the reason the orthopedic surgeon does that is that muscle has a tremendous amount of blood vessels, vasculature. And so the, it's well known that you, you need lots of vasculature uh, to get new bone formation. And when you take an x-ray of this, you see this gigantic callus. This is all bone. And all these varications in here are actually blood vessels uh, with bone around them. So this is the callus which forms. And eventually, the callus becomes um, um, uh, molded down until you get a normal uh, bone formation in, in this regard. And so it turns out there's this new paper which just blew my mind, which shows without a doubt that muscle, these big skeletal muscles in, in the mouse contain committed osteochondral progenitor cells that contribute to the callus that's formed in <clears throat> bone. And they use lineage tracing and, again, single cell RNA sequencing to eliminate uh, MSCs, to eliminate the, the skeletal muscle progenitors. Those are not the guys who are doing this. It's a separate cell that's in muscle that actually contributes to callus formation. So although the orthopedic surgeons <coughs> were doing this for good reasons, um, they actually um, uh, didn't understand that they were, the muscle was contributing committed progenitors to the callus. The, the committed progenitors come from marrow, they come from the periosteum, but they also come from the muscle surrounding the callus. So the MSC in this callus, in this blastema, by its position and its natural capacity, actually helps regulate adult tissues to um, regenerate themselves after injury. So again, this is a very important, hugely um, uh, necessary cell that has evolved to provide these capacities of control. So can I regenerate my cut fingertip? This is the question. And again, the take home lesson is from these um, uh, uh, regenerative activities of the newt where you cut off the limb, you get a clot to form, and, and then the blastema grows out and you get regeneration of that limb. And here are the details. The important aspect, one of the key aspects is you get this covering of epithelial cells to give you an apical ectodermal ridge, and that leads uh, the regenerative out, regenerative blastema out. The blastema is made up of committed progenitor cells and MSCs, and these nerves that grow into the blastema are actually providing signals for um, the, the expansion of the blastema. The rule of th the rule of thumb is that don't go to the emergency room because a resident is going to throw a stitch through that bleeding appendage, and that will cause scar tissue, and that will inhibit all of these reactions. So again, you need the epithelial cells to grow over, form an apical ectodermal ridge. You, <clears throat> you need the blastema to form with MSC and
This is Stephen Badalek. Dr. Badalek um, um, takes pig bladder and he takes the cells off and he morselizes the pig bladder and he puts it on cut wounds uh, of human or rodent pigeons. This is a gentleman. He's not giving you the bird. This is a gentleman who has regenerated his cut off fingertip. He's showing you this is the wound that Badalak put his magic fairy dust on. And this is the sequence of events of the regeneration uh, of this fingertip by this gentleman <coughs> who is about my age. And so Badalak uh, has given ECM with powerful molecules in it to help with the regenerative aspects. And again, the answer is yes, I can regenerate this fingertip as this gentleman did. And if you think this is a one-off thing, I suggest you Google fingertip regeneration pictures and you'll see pages and pages of fingertips which have all been regenerated even though they've been guillotined off. And again, um, fantastic regeneration after a, a, a hugely uh, dramatic um, uh, uh, loss of a fingertip. So the answer is, yes, I can. You get a keratinocyte covering, you get mesenchymal committed progenitors, and you get MSCs in that blastema to help you orchestrate this regeneration. There are no stem cells in adults. Do you, can you hear me now? because I think this is the management of committed progenitors. So MSCs dock at sites of broken blood vessels. They uh, help control the immune system. They have a regenerative component and they manage the innate capacity of that tissue to regenerate. MSCs are bound to the basement membrane uh, of blood vessels. They're bound by anchorage of this molecule, PDGFBB. We know this molecule is in a preparation of a platelet-rich plasma and is the, the major component for unhooking the pericyte and causing MSC differentiation and eventually medicinal activities. So um, uh, MSCs, um, uh, uh, can set up a regenerative microenvironment. They're drug stores for sites of injury or inflammation, and they manage the innate regenerative capacity. MSCs are not mesenchymal stem cells. They are not stem cells. They are medicinal signaling cells. They arise from perivascular locations. They sense the microenvironment. They control the immune system in the neighborhood. They secrete either uh, inflammatory or anti-inflammatory molecules, depending on what they see. They make molecules that sit on opioid receptors, so they've been involved in pain management. They make molecules which are antibacterial that are naturally found in your mouth called defensins. These same molecules bind to the spike protein of the sars covid 2 virus and therefore they can be curative for COVID and MSCs stimulate a cascade of reactions that set up regulatory T cells that last in your body for months if not years to provide therapeutic information. MSCs are not, are not stem cells, they're medicinally signaling cells. They can, as a hundred, over a thousand clinical trials for all of these uh, clinical symptoms that MSCs are now being tested for. And my forecast is that when these clinical trials get approved by the FDA, uh, that they will change the way medicines practice. And the way medicine is practiced now, physicians uh, manage the innate regenerative capabilities of the tissues involved, and that's what MSCs do. So MSCs will actually play a huge role in that. So 
can you hear me now? Because this is the important aspect. MSCs are going to change the way medicine's practiced and the physicians are going to become cell biologists and manipulate those systems. So this is my favorite quote from Winston Churchill. We're finally at the end of the beginning for cell-based therapy. Uh, all of the research in my laboratory is supported by NIH, and there's clearly a large number of people at the Skeletal Research Center for which I'm clearly the mouthpiece. Thank you for allowing me to give this lecture.